I see? You know, I'm so thankful you all came out this morning. It's Sunday morning at the 2010-2011 conference, and I know we've had a really full week, but the Lord still has blessings yet in store today. So I'm thankful you came to this devotional this morning. We are going to be blessed. Why don't we invite the Spirit of our Father, of our Heavenly Father, the Spirit of God, to come and join us today as we listen to the morning devotional. So if you would please bow your heads with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you have poured out upon this conference so far. We know that you have yet more in store this morning. So we ask, Father, that you will be with the speaker. Help her words, Father, to be your words. And help our hearts to be opened to your Holy Spirit that we can truly learn the lessons that you have in store for us today. We thank you so much for all of your blessings. We ask this in your name. Amen. I have a prayer as pure as gold that where you lead me Good morning, GYC. This is, this is it. Are we ready? I think oftentimes Sunday morning is the hottest part of GYC. It's kind of like everything is over. It's time to go back home and start living out what we have learned. Amen? And I pray by the grace of God that we are ready to go back home and live a life of no turning back. This morning, I'm going to share with you a message that is very, very dear to my heart. And it's a message that I think if I could preach no other message, it would be this one. 
And so I ask you permission to speak to your hearts this morning. I'm going to speak my heart. And I'm going to lay on our hearts a burden that is very, very heavy on my heart. So I ask you to pray for me. Pray for yourselves and pray that God would speak to each one of us this morning. Amen? Amen. The title of our message is Ready to Die. What's our title? It's not morbid, I promise. Um, ready to Die. And as we think about that title, there are many people we can think of in this world who are willing to die for something that they believe in. Martin Luther King Jr. is the celebrated champion of America's civil rights movement. And we know those famous words of how he had a dream, right? He lived for that dream and he died for that dream, assassinated in 1968. In his speech at the Great March on Detroit on June 23, 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. said these very, very powerful words that are going to form the springboard of our message this morning. And he said this, there are some things so precious, some things so eternally true that they are worth dying for. And I submit to you that if a man has not discovered something that he will die for, he is not fit to live. I'm going to read that last part again. I submit to you that if a man has not discovered something that he will die for, he's not fit to live. He's not worthy to live. Mark those words. Essentially saying that if we have not found something so dear to us that we're willing to die for it, we're not worthy of life. And this morning I'm going to ask us to reflect on two very simple yet profound questions. First, is our life worth living? And second, is the cause of Christ so dear to us that we'd be willing to die for it, if need be? Are we willing to say, no turning back till death? Before we get into this message, I ask that we pray. I'm going to kneel, but you can stay where you are. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we have gathered here this morning one more time to hear a word from you. Gracious Lord, we ask humbly that yet again you would send your Holy Spirit to be here with us this morning. That you would send your Spirit, Father, to speak to our hearts. And Father, to fall afresh upon each one of us here this morning. And dear Lord, for, for our sake and for the sake of our salvation, for the sake of everyone who's listening to this message this morning, we ask that you would take my thoughts, my words, my lips, and anoint them. That, Father, you would place the words in my mouth that need to be spoken. And that this morning, Jesus would be lifted up. That this morning, we would see and touch him. And that this morning, he would give us a new reason for living. It's for this that we pray. And it's for this that we ask, believing in Jesus' name. And I submit to you that if a man has not discovered something he will die for, he's not fit to live. Take your Bibles to Acts 21. Well, we're going to read together what is arguably a very moving and telling account in the life of the Apostle Paul. In Acts 21, when you get there, please say amen. Are we all there? Here are the pages turning. Are we there? Okay. 
We're going to breeze through a couple of themes together in the book of Acts this morning. But in Acts chapter 21, we find Paul in the midst of his third missionary journey. And as we are told in Acts chapter 20 and verse 16, he was hiring to be in Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. And so reading in Acts 21, I'm going to read in your hearing from verse 8. The Bible says, And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. You're reading this account, you're told that Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. And as he and his companions pause in Caesarea, they stop at the house of Philip the Evangelist. And as they are at his house, this prophet named Agabus comes down from Judea, and he has a message from the Holy Ghost. And the message is given for us in verse 11. That the prophet binds his own hands and feet, and then he says, this is what they will do to you, Paul, in Jerusalem. Now, this message is not new to Paul. If you go back to Acts 20, verse 23, as Paul is speaking to the elders at Ephesus, he tells them very clearly that as he's going to Jerusalem, he doesn't know what will befall him there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide him. So Paul is going there knowing that he's got bonds and afflictions waiting for him. And then here comes a prophet, Agabus, who confirms what he already knows. And he says, Paul, when you get to Jerusalem, they will bind you hands and feet, and they will deliver you unto the Gentiles. The message comes, Paul, yes. The Holy Ghost is saying, letting you know there's bonds, there's afflictions waiting for you. And then as Paul's companions hear these words, They fear for Paul. And we're told in verse 12 that they besought him not to go to Jerusalem. And so Paul's companions literally begged him. They pleaded with him, Paul, please don't go to Jerusalem. Because if you go, they will bind you hand and feet. They may even kill you. Please don't go to Jerusalem. And they did it with tears in their eyes. I want you to imagine the scene. The aged apostle Paul and his friends, Luke and his companions, kneeling before him with tears in their eyes. Paul, please don't go to Jerusalem. They will bind you and they will kill you. And then listen to Paul's response. As he speaks in verse 13, Paul says, What may need to weep and to break mine heart? Paul says, stop. Stop weeping. You're breaking my heart. Because I'm ready, not just to be bound, but also to die, if need be, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Here is a man who was ready to die. In his state of mind, it's, okay, there's bonds, there's afflictions, fine, bring it on. I'm ready to be bound and to die. And placing this in the context of Paul's ministry, we must remember that Paul had already demonstrated his willingness to die for the cause. Go back to Acts 14, and I want to read with you the account recorded in Acts chapter 14. There's a couple chapters before, and you get there, please say amen. 
In Acts chapter 14, we find Paul and Barnabas at Iconium. And we're told in verse 1 of Acts chapter 14 that it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude both of the Jews and also of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. And so as Paul and Barnabas enter Iconium, they begin to preach, to reason in the synagogue. And we're told that a great multitude believes. But as this great multitude believes, the unbelieving Jews stir up trouble. And then we're told in verse 5 of Acts chapter 14 that they go so far as to hatch a plot to use them despitefully and to stone them. Then verse 6 tells us, when they were aware of it, they fled unto Lystra and Derb, cities of Lycaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. Are you reading what's happening in this account with me? You would think that a man who was almost stoned, according to verse 5, the unbelieving Jews hatched a plot to use them despitefully and to stone them. So there's a very real threat that they might be stoned for preaching the gospel. And then when they become aware of the plot, they flee, and they get to the next city, Lystra and Derp, and guess what they do there? They preach the gospel. Now, you would think somebody who was almost stoned to death would have the sense not to repeat the crime for which he was almost stoned. Not so. They're almost stoned, they flee, and they keep on preaching the gospel. Fearless. And I can imagine them saying, stone me if you must. I cannot, dare not stop living for my Jesus. There they preach the gospel. Now lest we think it was just a threat, keep reading in Acts chapter 14. And by the time you get to verse 19, you are told that there came be the certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. So they actually did stone him. And verse 19 tells us that they drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. They did not just take some small little stones and throw them at him. They were trying to kill him. And the end of that verse tells us that they only drew him out thinking he was dead. So that tells you they stoned him until they convinced themselves he was dead. And so here's the Apostle Paul, bruised, bleeding at the point of death, stoned for preaching the gospel. And they drag him out thinking he is dead. And then verse 20 tells us how Bait, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derb. And when they had preached the gospel to that city. Now I'm going to pause because I'm thinking I'm reading about somebody who's kind of out of his mind here. Verse 21 tells us there they preached the gospel. And according to verse 20, the next day, the very next day, here's a man stoned to death, bleeding, battered, bruised from the stoning. He gets up, and the very next day, guess what he's doing? Preaching the gospel. It's like, Paul, don't you get it? Isn't this the man who was stoned just yesterday? Yes. Is he still bleeding? Probably. Is he hurting? Probably he's hurting. But that was not enough to stop him. Preaching the gospel. Here's a man who was ready to die. Stone me if you must. Kill me if you must. I will still keep on preaching the gospel. Here's a man who was ready to die. Martin Luther King Jr., I in a quote again, if a man has not found something that he will die for, he's not fit to live.
History records, as we have learned from our evening devotionals already, that Paul did die for the cause of Christ. He was beheaded. And Paul doesn't stand alone. Many of the other disciples suffered the same fate. Andrew, the brother of Peter, preached the gospel throughout Asia. He was arrested, crucified on a cross, two ends of which were fixed transversely in the ground. Then you know of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, stoned to death while preaching the returning Savior. Luke, the gospel writer, traveled with Paul to various countries and was supposedly hanged on an olive tree by idolatrous priests in Greece. And then there are others in our more recent history. David Livingstone died on his knees in the mission fields of Africa, having given his life and his youth to bring the gospel to unreached people groups in Africa. In 1956, Jim Elliott and his missionary friends died in the jungle of Ecuador. You know how they died? They had gone there trying to bring the gospel to a hostile Indian tribe. And they were speared to death. You know what a spear is? Poisonous spear? They were speared to death by that same tribe. People who are ready to die. And lest we think that these are ancient examples, let me give you something that's happening today. And I spoke with you very briefly about our missionaries and impact Zamba. Impact is an acronym. Inspired missionaries proclaiming the advent of Christ today. Impact Zambia. And they took a mission last year, two years ago now, 2009, to Luano Valley. Now Luano Valley is one of Zambia's most remote areas ever. Completely unentered territory. And it's the kind of place where cars cannot even travel there. You know, they had to walk for over 48 hours through the valley to get to homes to preach the gospel. On top of that, walking through the valley, they were beset by scorpions, snakes, and crocodiles that had to cross the river to get there. And then on top of that, they slept in the bush, in the open bush at night, not knowing if they'd wake up the next morning. Friends, these are young people just like me and just like you literally risking their lives to bring the gospel to Luana Valley, unentered territory. They could have died. And they were willing to go anyway. And as I tell you about Impact Zambia, in 2010 alone, through these dedicated missionaries, who work out of Lusaka Central Avenue Church in Zambia, at least 2,500 people have been baptized. I don't think you heard me, Jew, I see. That amen was too weak. 2,500 souls, three young people in one year alone. Why? Because they stop at nothing. They stop at nothing. If it means risking their lives, they're willing to go. They stop at nothing. And as you think about these martyrs, you think about Paul, Stephen, Peter, you think about the missionaries I was told you about in Impact Zambia. They're human beings just like us. They could have turned back, they could have given up when the threat of death became very real, but they were ready to die. Richard Warmbrand, founder of the Voice of Matters, has this profound quotation to say, a man really believes not what he recites in his creed, but only the things he is ready to die for. The things we believe are not the things we say and sing and write about. The things we believe are the things that we're ready to die for. 
in simple terms, if we're not ready to die for Christ, we don't believe in him. If we're not ready to die for him, we do not believe in him. Don't lose Acts. We'll come back there, but flip to Revelation chapter 12. And I want to share with you the kind of followers that Christ is asking us to be this morning, right? Revelation 12, verse 11, and I think this verse is what, for me, captures the essence of who these young people are and what they live for. Revelation 12, are we there? I'm going to read verse 10 and verse 11. And the Bible says, Revelation 12, 10 and 11, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Look at the last half of that verse. They loved not their lives unto the death. That's telling you and me that these people, these brethren who we're supposed to be a part of, did not love their lives. There was something that they loved more than their lives, and that was Christ. They did not love their lives unto the death. If death, if what is, if death is what it took, they were willing. And so, yes, we must be ready to die. And you know we talked about do loss on Friday morning, this mindset of choosing to be a slave of God. The other half of do loss is that it's a lifetime commitment. What is it? Once you commit and you say you're choosing to be a slave, it's do loss until death. But here's the other half of the coin, and this is really the heart of our message this morning, that yes, we must be ready to die, but you cannot, and please listen to this very closely, you cannot die for something that you have not learned to live for. Did you get what I said? We we can sit here and talk about, yes, we're ready to die. Yes, we're willing to die for Christ. But if we have not learned to live for Jesus, We cannot die for Jesus. We cannot die for Jesus. Go back to the book of Acts, and I want to show you how this was true in Paul's ministry and Paul's life. In Acts 20, back in Acts 20, where Paul is speaking to the elders at Ephesus, it's his last time seeing them, and he has a message of warning and reproof for them. He says to them, and we're going to read in your hearing, from verse 22 in Acts 20. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry that I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And Paul is saying here that I'm going bound and I know that bonds and afflictions abide me. But verse 24 says, none of these things move me. Here is a man who's expecting bonds and afflictions and he says, I'm not even moved. Nothing moves him. You know what that means? He's not even affected, not even worried, nothing. He's not even moved. Why? Because he counts not his life dear unto himself. There is one thing and one thing only that Paul counted dear, and that was the ministry that caused the name of the Lord Jesus. If he had to choose between finishing the ministry that Christ had given him and preserving his life, Paul would choose a ministry. His life was a thing to be dispensed with. I count not my life dear unto myself. 
I count not my life dear unto myself. And Paul was ready to die for Jesus, but Paul was ready to die because he was ready to live for Jesus. If I were to ask us here this morning, how many of us love Jesus? I, 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 I think every hand would be up. At least I hope so. And if I were to ask us, how many of us, by the grace of God, would be ready to die for Jesus? I think our hands would still be up, right? But here's the point. You cannot die for Jesus if you have not learned to live for him and him alone. He that is faithful in the least is faithful also in much. Many of us play around with Jesus now. And then we think that when the great day of trial comes, we'll suddenly have the moral courage to die for him. That's a deception. That's a deception. How can you think you can die for Jesus if you don't even love him enough to spend at least an hour with him every morning in devotions? How do you think you can die for Jesus? when you don't love him enough to walk away from those darling sins that are so hateful to him. Cherishing sin in our hearts, yes, we'll die for Jesus. Hello? How do you think you can die for him when you don't love him enough to die to yourself every day? How can we die for him, friends, when we don't love him enough to care about those perishing souls he died for? How can we die for him? Dying for Jesus begins with living for Jesus. It's about living for Jesus. If something is worth dying for, it must be worth living for. And let's not fool ourselves into thinking that we can be martyrs for Jesus. Don't even love him enough. You read Acts 20, And you read of Paul's ministry, a man who loved Jesus. He tells you in verse 20 that he kept back nothing. Acts 20 verse 20. How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've shewed you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks. Here is a man who lived for Jesus. As you go down in the chapter, he tells you, In verse 26 and 27, 26, I take it to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Verse 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Here's a grown man with tears in his eyes, warning people to turn to Jesus. Here is a man who lived for Jesus. There's no doubt in our minds that Paul lived for one thing only. Matter of fact, Here's how he puts it in his own words in Philippians 1 verse 21. Let's go there and read how Paul in his own word writes about his reason for living. In Philippians 1 and verse 21. Are we there? It's a very simple verse. Another one you can take and post on your walls and your Facebook statuses. Because this is a rule to live by. In Philippians 1 verse 21, Paul says, Are we there? For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Ponder that statement and keep pondering it. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. He had no other reason for living beyond Jesus.
living for Christ. And as you think about what it means to say to live as Christ, when you get to that point in your experience when everything you do is for one great object, everything you do is for one purpose and one purpose only in mind. And matter of fact, friends, I want to submit to you this morning that for you and for me, especially as Adventist young people, we have no other reason to live. Don't lose Philippians, but turn to another verse in which Paul states this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want to read this particular verse and have you reason through it with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to read verse 14 and verse 15. Are we there? The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Look at the logic of verse 15 again. He died for all, so that those who live should no longer live unto or for themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. If I'm reasoning correctly, this verse seems to say very clearly that Jesus died to give us a new reason to live. He died for all that whereas before we lived for ourselves, now we might live for him who died and rose again. That's why he died, to save us, yes, but also to give us a new reason to live. Before we lived for ourselves, and now if we believe and accept his death and resurrection, we are to live for him and him alone. You know, many of us look at Peter's denial of Christ, and we think, how could Peter do that? And yet, friends, I submit to you this morning that if we go through life living for any other reason other than Christ, that is a denial of Christ's death and resurrection. Because Jesus died so that we might have a new reason to live, to live for him and him alone. And when I say live for Christ, I'm not saying that all of us need to quit what we're doing and go into full-time ministry, no. God may call some of us to do that. But for the rest of us, that means everything we do, everything we do in life must be for Christ and Christ alone. Don't go to school just to get a degree and get those perfect A's. Yes, work hard, excel, get those A's. But use those A's for Christ evangelistically. Don't go to work just to earn a paycheck and get promoted. Yes, work hard, be an excellent employee. But use your excellence for Christ. Use it evangelistically. Let me give you an example to make this real for you. You know, when I tell people that I went to Harvard, people place you on some kind of pedestal. Oh, Harvard, you must be so smart. And there's a certain respect that people have for Harvard, and and maybe rightly so, I don't know. But here's my point this morning. God is no respecter of Harvard degrees. He's not a respecter. What is Harvard to God? He, God is wisdom personified. Harvard professors know nothing compared to God. When I get to heaven, God is not going to care that I went to Harvard. At the welcome table, there is no special seat for Harvard graduates. Absolutely not. The only reason, and get this clearly, the only way, the only reason my Harvard education will matter in eternity 
is if when I get to heaven, I can say, Father, because I went to Harvard, here's the harvest. Here are the people that came into the kingdom because of my time at Harvard. Friends, that's what life is about. That's what life is about. Ready to die and ready to live for Christ and Christ alone. There's no other reason to live. And you know, worse yet, I think some of us Adventists have this foolish idea that we can live the ordinary lifestyle. Let me tell you something, friends. Adventists are not ordinary. We're not ordinary people. The servants of the Lord tells us in last day events, and I want to read this in your hearing, and I want you to hear every word of this. Page 45, she reminds us that in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a a work of the most solemn import the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Do you understand why you are alive as a Seventh-day Adventist? That God has given to you And when we read this, we think corporately. God has given to us the last warning for a perishing world. Let's make this practically personal this morning. God has given to you the last warning for your classmates, your professors, your co-workers, and your neighbors. God has given to you a work of the most solemn import, no other work of such great importance. And then you want to walk through life being an ordinary person? You're not ordinary. You can never be ordinary. And worse yet, friends, the world has enough ordinary people. We don't need any more of them. We don't need any more ordinary Jim and Jacks. There are enough of them. Seventh-day Adventists are not ordinary. We cannot go back to the ordinary lifestyle. Not when we have a work of such great importance. Not when God has given us this last message of wanting to a perishing world. Not ordinary. It pains my heart that I think about how dedicated communists are. And in his book, Dedication and Leadership, Douglas Hyde writes about the the dedication of a communist and how a communist gets up every morning and he lives and breathes and moves for one thing only, and that's communism. And then communism is not even a cause worth living for, is it? And then here are Seventh-day Adventists who actually have not just a cause, but the greatest cause ever given to mankind in the history of the world. And they can't even live for it. God have mercy upon us. There's no reason why a communist should be more dedicated than a Seventh-day Adventist. No reason. Life for us, for me and you, is not about going through school and getting jobs and getting married and having babies. Those things are important. But we are to live life for one great object. If you go to school, go to school to advance the everlasting gospel. If you go to work, go to work to advance the everlasting gospel. If you marry, marry to advance the everlasting gospel. That's what life is about if you are a Seventh-day Adventist. 
And I think sometimes, friends, that this cause of God, this everlasting gospel doesn't consume us because we don't understand what sin has done to the heart of God. I don't think we remember, friends, that God feels my pain, right? God feels your pain. God feels the pain of every single person in this room. God feels the pain of every single person who has ever lived on the face of the earth. What do you think 6,000 years of sin have done to the heart of God? All of those over 800,000 people who perished in the Rwandan genocide, God felt their pain. The Jews massacred in the Holocaust, God felt their pain. Every woman who is raped, every child who dies of hunger, God feels their pain. 6,000 years of sin. What do you think that has done to the heart of God? Friends, nobody, nobody yearns for the end of the great controversy more than God does. Nobody. And Revelation 21, verse 4, paints a very clear picture of that. Revelation 21 and verse 4. In writing about the end, when there's a new heaven and a new earth. When there's a new heaven and a new earth. And Revelation 21 and verse 4 tells us, are we there? That God, listen to this, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Can you see the heart of God yearning for the end of this controversy? Yearning for the day when he will wipe away all tears from my eyes and your eyes. And then God has condescended to put it into our hands by the grace of God to hasten that day. And then we drag our feet and we go through life living for other things that are senseless to live for. And then we claim to love God. And then we claim to love him and we sing, oh, how I love Jesus. God is hurting. And we're here dragging our feet, living for ourselves. And we claim to love him. If you are separated from your loved one, from your sweetheart, you would do probably anything to be reunited with them again. Because love from a distance is difficult, is it not? And then you say God is our beloved. We say we love God. And we're not working as hard as we can to hasten the day of our reunion with God. And we say we love him, shame on us. Shame on us. If we love God, we would see sin as he sees it. And if we love God, we would share his heart. We would feel as he feels about sin. We'd be moved to end this controversy so we can't go home. Friends, let me tell you something. God has not called us to change the world. That's a part of it. But you know how in Acts chapter 17, the Bible speaks about the apostles turning their world upside down? For us, it's even deeper than that. Because God is calling us to end the world. Did you hear what I said? Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end shall come. The preaching of the everlasting gospel brings the world to an end. Is there a greater purpose worth living for? Is there a higher aim worth living for? Is there 
then how can we go through life saying we love God and yet trying to live the ordinary life when we have a world to end and we have a work of the most solemn import. I pray earnestly that God would give us deeper love for him, that God would give us true, earnest love for him. Because if we loved him, friends, we wouldn't need to wait for somebody to remind us to do evangelism or to witness for Christ or to share the gospel. Nobody reminds you to go to school, do they? At least if you're a good student, they shouldn't. Nobody reminds you to go to work. You get up and you go to work every morning because you know you have to. But we feel as though we need conferences. We need, we need something to remind us to do evangelism. Do you need to be reminded why you live? Do you need to be reminded why you live, friends? And I, I don't know how to communicate what I'm trying to communicate beyond just saying we cannot go back to the ordinary life. We've come to GYC. We've been inspired. We've been challenged. I fear some of us will go back and just go back to life as if that's just what it is. You get up in the morning, you go to work, you go to school, you come back, you sleep, you eat, you do whatever. May that not be our experience. May that not be our experience. If we are not turning back, <laughs> because turning back is not an option, because turning back is suicidal, if we are not turning back, we might as well go all the way. If we are not going to turn back, we might as well put our hands to the plow and go all the way. Review and Herald, July 21st. 1896. The great outpouring of the Spirit of God, which lightens the whole earth with His glory, will not come until we have an enlightened people that know by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. When we have entire, wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ, God will recognize the fact by an outpouring of His Spirit without measure. But this cannot be while the largest portion of the church are not laborers together with God. We're praying for his spirit to be poured out on us. And she reminds us <laughs> that this will not happen until we have entire, wholehearted consecration to service for Christ. Our lack of entire consecration is delaying the very thing that we're praying for, the pouring out of his spirit. And I think, friends, it's, it's time, isn't it? It's time for us to live for Christ and Christ alone. And friends, if I had time to speak to you about what some of the alive groups in, in Africa are doing, Africans living in view of eternity, alive Kenya, alive Ghana, alive Rwanda, alive Liberia, alive Ethiopia. 
and how close to 3,000 souls have been baptized in one year. And these are young people who are just groups of 80 or 70 or 90. But if GYC is an army of 5,000, 5,000 strong, what would North America be with an actual army of 5,000, not conference attendees, an army who are moved, who live and breathe and move for one reason only, to bring the gospel to all the world in this generation? What would North America be if we were an actual army of 5,000? who are ready to die and to live for Jesus. Because you know what? Jesus didn't just die for us. He lived for us. It was for us that Jesus lived and breathed and moved. For us. Can we do that for him? Let's not go back to the ordinary life. We cannot afford to. We're not ordinary, GYC. We're not I want to make an appeal, but I'm afraid of making an appeal because I feel that we're going to get up, we'll respond, we'll walk out of here and say, GYC was great, praise the Lord, and we'll go right back to the same drudgery. We'll be on fire for two weeks, then by the second month we're oh, sticking back to the drudgery of life. So I want us to pray this morning. I want us to pray and to beg God, to plead with God to give us love for Him. Because it's love for God that will keep us on fire this year, GYC. It's love for God that will make us ready to live and to die for His cause. It's love for God that will keep us from living the ordinary life. If a man has not found something he will die for, he's not fit to live. If we're just going through life like regular people, we're not, we're not worthy to be alive. So we, we're going to kneel, and we're going to beg the Lord to give us love for him.